Hello, I'm Connor Kennedy, and I'm going to present to you a solution to the use of code December 2023 Silver Problem 3, Target Practice. In this problem, we are given a list of targets and a sequence of moves. And when instructed, Bessie will either move left, which is symbolized by an L, fire, as symbolized as an F, and move right, as symbolized as an R. So in this example, Bessie, starts, Bessie always starts at position 0. So that first she's here, and then first she moves left, so then she's there. She fires, which deletes the target at uh, position negative one. She fires again, which doesn't do anything since the target is already broken. Then she moves right. She fires here, so the target at position zero is broken. Then she moves right twice. And so this sequence of actions breaks these targets, breaks two targets in total. However, we're allowed to replace one of these actions uh, with a different action. So for instance, in this problem, if we replace the second right move with a fire, then instead of just moving to the right here, Bessie will instead fire, stay at the same position and fire, which removes that third target and lets us get a maximum of three targets broken. So let's see if we can create a better way to visualize this in our heads. So another way we can think about this as moving on kind of a timeline. So Bessie starts at position zero and we're going to create kind of a timeline in decreasing or going down in increasing time. So first Bessie starts at position zero, then she moves to the left. So at time one, she is there. Then she fires. So she stays at the same position, fires again. And then she moves right. She fires. And then she moves right twice. So you can see that we're kind of visualizing uh, where she is over time and visualizing that using a 2D graph, sort of. And note that we can think of changes to this graph as being splits off of this main path. So for instance, in this example where we replace the last right move with a fire, instead of moving this way, uh, Bessie would just move straight down and fire. I'm going to represent that by a dotted line by being the instruction we changed. And let's say we change the instruction at a different place. Like for instance, we here, uh, at time two, instead of firing, we'd move Bessie to the left. So in this case, that would create a new timeline split here. And then from there, Bessie would continue carrying out all the other actions. So she would move back to the right, she would fire again, and she would move over again twice. Or maybe Bessie could do the very first move differently, so that she moves right instead of moves left. Then that would mean that she starts here, or she might take that dotted line. She immediately moves to the right, fires twice, Oops. moves to the right again, fires again, and then moves right twice. So we can think of all of these different courses of action as different timelines. So one thing we can think about is how far Bessie gets away from the main timeline. So if we look at this blue timeline on the right, we can see that this gets at most two distance units away from the main timeline, and it always stays two dis um, distance units away from the main timeline because it's following all the exact same moves, so it can't move away from that distance. Meanwhile, on the other side, we see that this timeline has a distance of one away. And I actually claim that the maximum distance you can get away from a timeline is two, and this can happen if you change a right move into a left move, in which case you move to the left, or if you change the left move into a right move, in which case you move to the right. And this is the furthest distance you can get away, since you're only allowed to change uh, one move at a time. So we can think of there being these five different timelines, uh, one that's two to the left, one to the left is zero, which is the main timeline, then one to the right and two to the right. And whenever we change a move from the main timeline, it sends us to another one of these different timelines. 
So now that we had this visualization, let's think about how we might actually solve the problem. So uh, one idea we can do, which is the brute force idea, is to simply try every single possible move change and see how many targets it hits. However, uh, since for every character there are two different things you can switch it to, this will lead to two different or two n different possible timelines, or two n different possible possibilities that we would have to look at. And this is way too many to check since each of them also has length n, meaning that, well, we'd have to check two n squared moves, which is too many. So we'll have to do something a little bit smarter. One observation we can make is that every single possible switch uh, leads us on a similar path than the timelines. First it starts off on the main timeline, then there's a switching move, and this move could be different for any possible uh, move. And then we would get sent down the rest of the time on one of the timelines. So an idea we can have is that we just check, since all of them start off on the main timeline, if we remember like what targets were shot along that main timeline, then we would remember, then if we go backwards on the alternate timelines and quickly check which targets, uh, which new targets are shot, then if we use some pre-calculation on the main timeline, we will be able to quickly answer for any changing move, whether or which targets are shot. To simplify things a bit, Let's only look at two timelines at a time. In this case, we're looking at the main timeline in green and the timeline shifted one to the left in orange. And then I've drawn all the moves that go between them in blue. So the idea of our solution is we want to kind of pre-calculate which targets were shot in the main timeline. So uh, first we start off with no target shot and that continues to be true until this time. And at this point, uh, the target at negative one has been shot. And here, the target at negative one has still been shot. Then we have here also still negative one. And then we have here, the target at zero gets shot. So we have negative one, zero gets shot. And then that stays the case until the very end. So if we pre calculate which targets are shot, then now we can work backwards on the other timeline to try and figure out which targets get shot when we work backwards. So let's start with this last time here. We can see that if we take the changing move, uh, this blue line here, then this target one gets shot. So on the backwards timeline so far, nothing has been shot. So we have an empty array. But along the changing move, we have the target at one has been shot. So we can combine this array and the array of changing move shoots, and then the main timeline array, and we see that the targets negative one, zero, and one have all been shot. So we combine that into our answer of three. Even though that's our final answer, uh, let's look, continue looking at what we what would happen if we continue working backwards. So at this time here, uh, we still don't have anything shot on the orange timeline, and we see that this blue timeline would shoot the target at zero. So once we combine all the arrays, we still end up with NATO 1 and 0 because we can't shoot a target twice. So this means that our answer for this one is still 2. Let's look at this time. It's still empty for the backwards array. And now the shooting array is empty. So in this case, we just have an answer of minus 1, which is not useful uh, since we already know we already have a better answer. And this time is where it gets interesting, because in this case, the backwards timeline shoots negative one. Even though technically it hasn't happened yet, we're still working backwards. And then the changing array is also shot negative one. This still isn't a better solution though, since all three timelines have shot negative one. So that means that uh, this solution isn't any better. Um, then we have here, it's still negative one and then nothing is shot here, so this isn't better either. And then we keep going to the end. You can see that we don't find a better solution. So this set of targets that are shot here 
um, is our, the best we can do. Essentially what we're doing is we're going forwards in time, keeping track of which targets are shot. Then we're going backwards in time, keeping track of which targets are shot. And then we're combining those and seeing like what's the maximum. So yeah. Um, there are some details here that are a bit tricky though, because the number of targets that can end up being shot is quite large. And in fact, it's not we can't do this quickly enough if we did store just the just the arrays targets being shot. So we do something a little smart where instead of storing the uh, the targets themselves, we just store the earliest time that a certain target gets shot. So by the end here, we store negative one gets shot at time two, uh, zero gets shot at uh, zero, one, two, three, four, time five, and target one gets shot never, so we can say that's infinity. So we keep track of when each target gets shot. And then that allows us to do some calculations without having to do all of the calculations that involve that are involved in merging these arrays. And there's a bunch of other little details that are a little bit tricky to explain. So I'll leave it until when we go review our C++ code, which actually we're going to go do right now. Okay, so here's my C++ code for this solution. First, we do our input reading, uh, where we read on all their targets. And I actually store this as a map from integers to integers. Uh, this way, it makes it easy to see what position, uh, or if I'm at a position, I'll see if there's a target there, and I'll see like the index that position corresponds to. So that's why I use a map for that. Um, yeah, and then we read in our moves. And here's where we do our pre-calculation. This is for the forward direction in the main timeline. So we keep track of our position, and we keep track of the earliest time each target gets broken. So we start that off to be a big number, or infinity. So we loop through all the moves. We essentially just simulate the main timeline. If the current move doesn't move left, then decrease the position. If it's moved right, then increase the position. And if it's fire, this is the interesting case that we're interested in. <laughs> So if it's fire, we want to see, first of all, if there's a target at this position, that's what dot count does. It just sees if something is in the map. So if there's a target at position, uh, we get the index of that target. And if we've never broken this target before, which means that the array is storing infinity, then we set that to the current index and then add one to the total, because this is the earliest time that target gets broken. And the total will just keep track of how many targets we've broken in total. So that's it for all that we need to do to calculate in the main timeline. Now we move on to looking at the alternate timelines. So this is quite a bit of code, but just bear with me here. First, uh, we store our final answer in this variable. And then we try every alternate timeline. So. We remember that there are only four possible alternate timelines, uh, ranging from offset of negative two to offset of two, and that's ignoring the main timeline. So we try every single one of these alternate timelines individually. We keep track of a few arrays. Uh, first, we keep track of our forward total, and this is the total number of targets that have been shot in the forward timeline. And we also keep track of the backwards total, which is the number of targets that have been shot in the backwards timeline. So this is essentially just storing the lengths of those pre-calculated arrays that we had before. So yeah, and we also keep track of our current position. This way we can update our moves when we go backwards in time. And finally, we have a vector of boolean's, which just keeps track for each target whether we have broken it in the backwards timeline or not. So every time we want to move backwards in the backwards timeline, we have three things we need to do. First of all, we need to we need to undo the move in the main timeline. Second, we need to see all the connecting moves, and then finally, we need to 
we finally add our backwards timeline move. So these are the three things that three steps that we take for every backwards move. So let's go over each of them. First of all, we remove our main timeline move. So this is essentially saying uh, start us off right here and then get rid of this move so that we can consider this changing move. So to do that, the first first of all, it doesn't matter at all if the move is a left or right move because those don't affect the targets that are broken at all. Uh, so we check to see if it's a firing move and if it breaks a target. So if both of those are true, then we need to see which target was broken. And if this was the earliest time that target was broken, then we know that uh, we know that it would never have gotten broken in the main timeline since we're moving backwards in time. So then we subtract one from our f total, forwards total. And we also need to double check that this is not something we've already broken in our backwards timeline. Um, second of all, we uh, try finding the connecting moves. So first of all, if we can do it with a left or right move, and these are all the possible ways that that can happen, then we can just set our answer because the connecting move won't be firing at any targets, so we don't have to worry about that. And the answer is just the total number of targets that are broken in the forwards and backwards timelines. Next, we check to see if we can get back to the main timeline with a firing move. And if this is the case, then we need to check to see whether the firing move breaks any new targets. So we store that in the new break, and we check to see if the firing move happens at uh, <clears throat> if the firing move happens at a target, then we check to see whether we've already broken this target and whether this target has not been broken in the main timeline. Or I guess at this point the target has been broken. At, no. No, we do check whether to see the target has not been broken in the main timeline. And if that's the case, then this is a, we know this is a new break that our connecting move is doing. So then we can just add one to our answer. Finally, uh, we try moving the offset timeline backwards. This is essentially just erasing this last move here. And then we end up in a state where we're looking at only the previous moves. So what we need to do for that is we kind of need to move backwards. So in this case, if we move right, then we need to go left, so we subtract. If we move left, then we need to go right, so we add. And otherwise, we have a firing move. So we check to see if that hits a target. And if it hits a target and that target has not been broken before, then break that target and add ones to our back backwards total. However, we need to be careful, because if this was already broken uh, in the main timeline, then we need to unbreak it. So we just subtract one from our forwards total. And yeah, once we do that, then we're ready to move on to the next step. And then we continue moving backwards through the timelines. So once we do that for all of the all of the different timeline offsets, then we're able to just print out our final answer. And that's all for our code. This is a pretty difficult problem. Uh, one thing to note is it's not actually necessary to split up the forward total and backwards total. Uh, you can store these in the same variable. Uh, I just thought it would be more clear, and it also makes it easier to debug. So yep, uh, that's my solution to December 2023 Silver Problem 3. Thank you for watching.